Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First United Methodist Church of Crockett, Texas. I'm Pastor Michael Bedevian, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here today in worship and those of you worshiping with us on our Facebook live stream as well as those who are listening on KIVY radio. Welcome to you all. I do hope that if you're watching on the live stream, you'll check in with us somehow by writing uh, your, your uh, presence uh, in worship that way. Or uh, if you're present in the pews, by all means, sign in with the registration pads and let us know of your presence here today. Especially if you're a visitor, we would love the opportunity to uh, contact you by phone or send you an email or, or a letter to let you know how much we appreciate your being with us in worship today. Most of us are familiar with the great program Toys for Tots. You're going to be hearing more about that from Mike Maiden, a former Marine. He is bringing the Marine-sponsored program to Crockett, and our church is blessed to be asked to support this program. You'll be hearing from him more about that, but be thinking about supporting this very wonderful ministry for children in the coming months. Now I have a special announcement from Carissa Burke. She's going to come forward and share with you. Come on over here. I want everybody to see you really well. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was wanting to tell you guys, um, this past week we had an educational meeting and we talked about starting back our uh, family game nights. Um, and we had evening an evening where we invited families and, and also couples and just people of the church, anybody, any member of our church or anyone who's visiting, to come um, to celebrate together and have fellowship. So our first family game night will be Wednesday, October the 5th at 6.30. Um, and we would love for you guys to join us in the Family Life Center. Um, last time that we had these, we, we would um, do like minute to win it games or team building games. They were just fun for everybody. And if you weren't on a team, you could join someone's team or you could just watch and have fellowship. We will only be having dessert, so we'll start at 6.30. It's not going to be a meal, but we would love for you to come out and join with us. Um, again, that's Wednesday, October the 5th at 6.30. Thank you very much, Carissa. That sounds very exciting. I'm looking forward to that very much. I'd also like to mention that uh, I hope you'll be mindful that Sunday, October 2nd, is our upcoming church conference. Our church leadership, our budget, and our affiliation with the United Methodist Church will be voted on at this very important meeting, and I do hope all of our members will make every effort to attend. This concludes our announcements for the morning, but please check out the bulletin in reference to other important meetings and upcoming opportunities. Now let us join together in our call to worship, printed in your bulletin. We are here to touch the hymn of grace, to let go of the hymn of grace, to feel the surge of forgiveness, a rush of joy, to touch hope, to hear our name whispered and life affirmed, to sing praise and let me invite you now to stand as you're able as we sing together hymn 368, My Hope is Built, verses 1, 2, and 4.
please remain standing for our call, um, our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. come to time of prayer as congregation. I have one joy to share with you. It is always a blessing to have in our midst a couple who has celebrated 41 years of wedded bliss. That would be Clayton and Runette Star over here. We congratulate you. <laughs> the beautiful flowers are in honor of, of that great relationship. We are proud to be a part of your church family. I would also like to share with you uh, the uh, very sad and unfortunate news that Matthew Johnson, uh, he fell and fractured his hip yesterday. And uh, he was rushed by hospital, or I'm sorry, ambulance to the hospital, Palestine Regional. Uh, and um, I got to see him for a time there in the emergency room and they gave him some sedatives to help with the pain took x-rays and did all of those kinds of tests that need to be done and have determined that uh, he does have a fractured hip which will need to be uh, operated on and that will take place tomorrow. Uh, Palestine Regional Hospital, so please keep uh, Matthew Johnson in your prayers as well as his wife Evelyn. There are other prayer requests in your bulletin I know you'll want to be lifting up through the week as well. I do hope that you'll take these home with you and and uh, be, uh, be uh, very active in, in lifting all these up. Let us now go before God in prayer as a congregation. Heavenly Father, this morning we come in praise. We come to sing you hymns of love and gratitude because you're such an amazing blessing in our lives. And we know you're a righteous God who will always be just and good. You're a compassionate God who will always be present with us in our brokenness. You're a faithful God. And you're a redeeming God who rescues us from the bondage of sin. And so we want to thank you in this hour that we set aside our, our lives just for you. This morning, Lord God, we also want to lift up our church and community there are many who are passing through difficult times and seasons. We pray for those who are bearing very difficult, challenging physical ailments and struggles, those who are recuperating from accidents, those facing surgery or are healing from medical procedures. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring them healing and encourage and uplift them. And may your healing grace be rich in their lives. Father, we also want to lift up those who are walking paths that are straying from your Holy Spirit's calling, those who may not have discovered the joy of living in relationship with you. And Father, as we, we pray for them, we would remind ourselves that we have much brushing up to do in our own lives, for we are sinners, we are broken, 
and there is much cleansing to do in our own souls. But you have called us, Lord God, to seek the lost out, to mentor those who are growing, to help them mature with open arms of mercy as your Son has done for us. So allow us, Father God, to be your hands and feet, to be instruments of your peace, Father, we also pray for our church leaders and teachers. We ask that you'd grant them an abundance of wisdom and biblical insight to share with those whom they lead. Father, we want to be the kind of church that walks paths of righteousness and truth. We want to be a church that bears fruit for your kingdom, a church that will glorify you every day. Father, we want to give priority to those things that are close to your heart, most especially the making of disciples. Father, this morning we also wish to lift up the elected and appointed leaders of our country. We pray for those who serve in courts, seeking to make moral and ethical decisions. We ask, Lord, that all leaders of the land will be guided by your righteous discernment. Father, we want to be a people that is holy and blameless in your sight. And we know we have a long ways to go to meet that standard. Help us, the church, to understand our responsibility in reaching out in your name, to minister to the vulnerable, the brokenhearted, and the desperate. And help us to remember that we need to grow in our walk with you and become more aware and fluent in the truths of your word. Father, we pray all of these things and those unspoken words from our hearts in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd now like to invite our children to come forward to Miss Jolene, who has another wonderful message for you. everybody here with us this morning and uh, I thank you again for letting the people that are uh, vert vertically challenged to get up front so they can see what is going on you know what I mean vertically challenged <laughs> short right okay <laughs> have any of you ever been fishing fishing yeah yeah a lot of fun no well, maybe someday you'll get to go. What do you need to have in order to catch a fish? A fishing bowl, fishing um, bait, and a lake. Okay, some place to put it in, that's right. Or a river or a ocean or some, some place where the fish live. You're exactly right. And in my case, you have to have patience. I like catching. I'm not so much on fishing. <laughs> yeah, the wait time, you know, kind of gets to me. But it is a fun way to be outdoors and uh, uh, be there in nature. Now, in the Bible, in Matthew 4:19, uh, we are told that Jesus was out by the. Uh, uh, 
the, the water when some people were fishing. Those people were James, John, Andrew, and Peter. And they were fishermen. They had been fishing all day long. They certainly had more patience than I have. And fishing back in the olden days, and it still is, but not like it used to be, was really hard work. You had these big, heavy nets that you had to throw out into the water and then pull them in and take out the fish or whatever and then throw them out again. Well, they had been at this all day long and had not caught a thing, and they were very discouraged. And Jesus said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Yeah, something simple like that. And sure enough, they caught a ton of fish and were very, very happy, as you can imagine. Now, Jesus said to them, come with me and I will make you a fisherman of people. People? Who in the world ever thinks about catching people? Now remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the fact that Jesus talked in parables often. So what do you think his parable was about when he said, I will make you a fisherman of people? What do you think? He wanted him to go tell people about him. That's right. That soft little voice. He wanted them to go tell other people about himself. You got it. And that's how you become a f what they call a fisher of men. So what are some ways that you catch people? Bait? What's the bait you use? Bread. Bread? You catch people with bread? All right. Maybe so. <laughs> uh, because one of the things Jesus wanted us to do was feed the hungry, wasn't, wasn't it? So using bread as an example of feeding the hungry. What else do you think? The Bible. Using the Bible, that's right. Referring to it? Uh, giving them uh, noodles. Giving noodles. Noodles another good f food for people. Love. Giving love, that's right. Because the best bait that you can use for catching people is to be your best self. Because then people will say, I want to be just like them. And that means that they will follow your example and follow Jesus. Now, today's activity is this. Like that? Okay. Uh-huh. And I in your packet, you will have, I have already stapled the net. There's a net on the front. And you can slip your people into that net and glue everything on there. And just to keep you going, there's some fish gummies that go with it. Ooh. Uh, pardon? I think they are. So thank you for coming up. Get your packet. And don't forget that, uh, and y'all are real good about doing this, bring your packet uh, empty back to me at the end of the, of the uh, service. Thank you. Jolene, that was wonderful. I'd like to invite now our, our ushers to come forward so we may present to God his tithes and our gifts.
65, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Please stand for the reading of today's scripture. Lamentations 3, verses 23 to 25. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you please be seated? And join me now in a word of prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that you'll hide me behind the cross of Christ. And it's my prayer that you'll use the words that come from my lips. Either because of them or in spite of them, allow your Holy Spirit to move in all of our hearts to bring us transformation, to bring us greater understanding of the walk you call us to walk with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So there is a great and beloved old hymn that is written by a man by the name of Thomas Chisholm. And this hymn reminds us of why the words read a moment ago so beautifully by Troy. Words from Lamentations are so very important to us as human beings. I want to turn your attention to that hymn. It's on page 140 in your hymnal. The hymn title is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And, and I've asked Robbie to accompany us. If you just sing the first verse with me on that. I believe everyone in this room has experienced God's faithfulness in a personal way. And you know what it means to feel his forgiving mercies in your life. You know what it means to experience his love, his undeserved love. But I also know that most of us are familiar with how life can sometimes turn on us in very ugly ways. I'm sure most of us have experienced moments when there are no clear and visible answers for dealing with the sharpest pains we've ever faced. A doctor tells us there's nothing else they can do. A senseless elementary school shooting takes the lives of innocent children and teachers. A spouse's unfaithfulness is discovered, crushing your heart and dreams of the future. A home is destroyed by tornado or fire. These are just a few of the many things that we experience on this earth. And we cry out in those moments and many others saying, why God, why? There's no denying that life is a mixture of pain and pleasure, of victory and defeat, and success and failure. In a world sometimes defined by tragedy and loss and failure, 
I wonder, can words like faith and hope and love ever ring true? Or do they sound more like religious denial to some people in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary? I wonder how people deal with some of the most severe broken experiences in life. If you've lived on this imperfect, sin-riddled, corrupt planet for any length of time, I'm fairly certain you've seen and endured all sorts of trials and suffering. The past few years alone have been filled with a wide variety of struggles and suffering and brokenness for many of us. As Christians, some of us might wonder why God allows these things to happen. I mean, we come to church every Sunday and hear about how God is sovereign and mighty and how loving he is. How he is good all the time. And then tragedy strikes. And most normal people will ask the question below their breaths, if not vocally, why is this happening? Why would God allow this? I think where a lot of people get messed up is that they ask the question, then they come to a wrong conclusion about God. And that's been the cause of many people turning their backs on the Lord. But even Jeremiah, the writer of Lamentations, understands that those who love the Lord will occasionally face brokenness in their lives. I want you to listen to his words in verse 19, where he writes, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. You see, Jeremiah knew and accepted the truth that life has its ups and downs. And anybody listening to me this morning is certainly aware of this truth. However, knowing it doesn't make it easier to accept. So this morning I want to talk about the problem of suffering and God's faithful presence in the midst of those times that we're experiencing grief and misery. We need to be reminded because it's inevitable that difficult days will come. So let's look at some of those words in this morning's passage again. Great is your faithfulness. When we think of faithfulness, we think of someone who is firm in their commitment, not just when times are good. We think of someone who is reliable and dependable. I think you and I have discovered that because we're all human, no one is going to be completely, 100% of the time, dependable. Every now and then, even the one you trust the most might slip up. Maybe not intentionally, maybe accidentally, but it will most likely happen. Maybe they promised to be there for you, and they weren't. And you question the whole idea of faithfulness. Is there such a thing? On the other hand, Jeremiah had an amazing amount of trust in God's faithfulness. I mean, he was willing to put himself out there in harm's way, taking risks and obedience to God because he trusted God's faithfulness. Let's look at what he did in the midst of a terribly threatening situation. An absolute conviction that God would be faithful. First of all, let's look at the setting of Jeremiah's ministry. It took place during some of the darkest years of Judah. You'll, you'll remember that Israel was divided into two countries, Judah and Israel. And the word tells us in chapter 2 of Jeremiah, God's people exchanged their glory for worthless idols. They lived as a prostitute with many other gods. The lifeblood of the innocent poor was on their clothes. God said this about his people. He said, they are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. The prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. Think about this. 
Are times that different today? And does the Bible not speak to us today about these things? So Jeremiah tells Israel, God is going to send his people into captivity. There's going to be punishment. And in our text, Jeremiah includes this message. This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Well, if you read the whole story, you'll see how some of the princes and nobles came to the king of Judah with a request. They didn't like what Jeremiah said. They told the king, this man Jeremiah should be put to death. He's discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as other people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of the people, but their ruin. Well, the king Zedekiah, who was weak, he decides to do nothing to stop them from punishing Jeremiah. But since they don't have the conscience to kill him, they throw him into a cistern, a deep well, instead. So Jeremiah was taking a risk by speaking out by not simply telling the people what they want to hear. And you can be sure Jeremiah was well aware of Israel and Judah's past record with the prophets who told the country things they didn't want to hear. So it was a pretty risky thing for him to say, wasn't it? Obviously the king, among others, wasn't very thrilled with Jeremiah's prophecy. But Jeremiah was faithful in his commitment to God. He did what he was told. He warned them. But this was just a small part of Jeremiah's trust in God. Jeremiah trusted the Lord so much, he believed that God would have the final word on this matter, that God would ultimately be faithful to his chosen ones. So it's more amazing, even though Judah was surrounded by the Chaldeans, and his warning about Israel's loss, or, or Judah's loss, was, was an accurate prophecy. Jeremiah bought land in Israel, or in Judah. He bought land. Someone came to him with an opportunity to buy land right then, and he bought it. Buying land in a war zone. Can you imagine that? It would be like investing in Afghanistan property 20 years ago. <laughs> Things were going to get bad in Afghanistan. Everybody knew it. And Jeremiah knew that things were going to get bad in Judah. But he knew about God's faithfulness too. Yeah, things were going to get bad. It was a country that had no hope in winning that battle. It was a virtual certainty that the Judah citizens would be led away into exile. But in the midst of that upheaval and impending invasion, Jeremiah brought property. He trusted God for the eventual outcome. So getting back to the story, the stubborn and the stiff-necked leaders put Jeremiah in a pit. Now when you're in a pit, there's only one direction to look up. And what direction is that? Up, right? That's right. Certainly, Jeremiah often struggled in faith, and he was often referred to as the weeping prophet. But he did look up. He looked up to God. And God strengthened Jeremiah with his promises. In chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, we read, read telling him, telling the prophet, Today I have made you a fortified city an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you. They will not overcome you. God's telling this to Jeremiah. They will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. 
And again in chapter 15 of Jeremiah, God told him, I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome. For I am with you to rescue and serve you, save you. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. And so in chapter 20, Jeremiah confessed in faith, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fall and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. He was finding great comfort in that moment. And so he praised God. Sing to the Lord, he said. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. In the pit or anywhere else which troubles us, the only place to look for help, my friends, is up to God, to his promises, to his word. And as Jeremiah looked up for help and deliverance, it helped for him to know he was proclaiming not his own words or ideas, but God's. And God made this clear to Jeremiah throughout his ministry. This is what he was to do. I don't want you to be like those other priests making up things as they go along. In chapter 1 9, we read, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. In chapter 19, 2, There proclaim the words I tell you. In chapter 25, Now prophe prophesy all these words against them and say to them, in chapter 30, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in the book all the words I've spoken to you. And in chapter 36, we read, Go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scrolls of the words of the Lord that you wrote as I dictated. Read to them all the people of Judah who came in from their towns. Most importantly, there is, there is nowhere else to look but up for salvation. Jeremiah believed that. He looked to God's words, God's promises for salvation, not anyone else's. And the Lord said, return, O faithless Israel. I will frown on you no longer, for I am merciful. The people who survived the sword... He's talking about those who listen to Jeremiah and leave and go into exile. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the desert. I will come to give rest to Israel. I have loved you with an everlasting love. In chapter 31, 2 and 3. I am with you and I will save you. I will not completely destroy you. All these words were spoken to a rebellious nation. God was inviting the whole wayward nation to look up for salvation. Now I want you to think about this. All of this was taking place 600 years before Jesus came. And when God said these words about those who would survive the exile, when the Lord offered those words, he wasn't just referring to Israel's return from bondage. That wasn't the salvation he was offering them. Certainly he orchestrated that, but he was talking about something much greater. He was talking about sending his son. I will come to give rest to Israel. I will come, he said. You remember Jesus' words? Come to me all who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Since the kings of Judah had failed to lead God's people, God promised he would come and lead his people himself. God would lead his people in righteousness. Not only would he be righteous, his unfailing compassions are so great that Jesus makes us righteous before God. 
he would give God perfect obedience that was demanded from sinners. He'd be the one to give God that. He would be the one to supply the righteousness that every one of us lacks. He would be the perfect, blameless sacrifice. He would be called the Lord our righteousness. And yet to do that, he had to leave the kingdom of heaven, the glorious, holy, perfect kingdom of heaven. He had to come down to earth. He had to become like us, with flesh, and experience all of the things we experience on this world in the first century. Now talk about being in the pit. He looked down on our pitiful condition, was born of a poor virgin girl, left the glories of heaven to take upon himself everything that we've done wrong. And he faced constant pressure from his enemies who tried to trap him or prove inconsistency in his teaching, not to mention the temptations of Satan. Any claim to be connected to the Father was treated as blasphemy. And yet he maintained his righteous walk because the Lord our God is our righteousness. And through his perfect life and innocent suffering and death and rising from the dark pit of death, he has won for us righteousness. This is the door to heaven, the door to God, the door to life in Christ. Righteousness in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that. When people look at the trouble they go through, they'll say, well, I know God has a plan. Well, God's plan is salvation for all humanity. His plan is to tear down pride and rebellion. His plan is to make the comfortable and sin uncomfortable. But his plan is also to build up, to comfort the afflicted with God's grace. Because he's a faithful God, a compassionate God, a loving God who cherishes each and every one of us. And so when you find yourself in the pit, and you want to ask yourself, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Let us remember, the deepest level of worship is praising God through the pain, thanking God through the trials, trusting God even when we're tempted to lose hope, and loving God even when he seems distant. We're called to look up to God. He will be there with you. That's because at our lowest, God is our hope. At our darkest, God is our light. At our weakest, God is our strength. And at our saddest, God remains our comforter. This is the God we worship. The God who loves us unconditionally. This is the God who has a final word on anything that we might ever face. He is the one who conquers sin and death for us. I ask you, where else will you find a love like that? So my friends, when you find yourself in the pit, look up. Because great is his faithfulness. Great is is his faithfulness. Thank God Almighty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, I would invite you to join me in this closing hymn, number 701. We'll be singing together, When We All Get to Heaven, verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
Let us pray. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Oh.